you have these pharmaceutical companies investing heavily, heavily, heavily in not only nutrition research, but, but drug research. The nutrition research is, I think, when it's funded by Coca-Cola or someone else, well, guess what we're going to get? We're going to get these ridiculous studies. That, where was beef? Beef was at the very bottom. I'll tell you one thing for sure. I'm very interested in being part of the national conversation to get a grip on, our, on the health of our nation. We are, as a, as a nation, we're very, very sick. I think we're a lot sicker than we realize we are. And we, we need to have people just speaking truth and defending evidence-based medicine, because I'm telling you right now, evidence-based medicine is dead in America right now. We need to revive it. Dr. Smedis, your Senator Smedis, welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much for doing this. Take taking the time. I know you got to be super busy. I don't know if you know. I used to live in where you where you are now. I used to live in Albuquerque. I was a practicing yeah. orthopedic surgeon out on the west side of town at Rust. Uh, so I think you're wow. at I think you're at Lola's West Side. And I also went to University of Texas into my medical school at Texas Tech. So we have some things in common, <laughs> I would say. Wow, so, got a lot in common. Yeah, exactly. I was looking <laughs> through your background. I said, well, hell, I did all that. I mean, we're kind of similar. So um, the reason, you know, I, I thank you for being gracious enough to um, appear here. And the reason, you know, because I, 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 I saw a tweet that somebody I follow sent, and it was one of yours talking about the fact that you're trying to make a difference with the, the public schools with, you know, improving the quality of the diet by removing, you know, garbage out of there, particularly, you know, sodas, which I don't think there's anybody that disagrees that that is clearly problematic for health. And, you know, Coca-Cola flew their executives in and, and squashed the bill. And that's, you know, that's got to be... Yeah, you know, it's got to be very frustrating to say the least. Um, let me ask you, if you don't mind, just about your background. How do you? How did you decide to go into politics? You know, going as an ENT, you know, which is uh, you know that's a full career as it is. What what prompted you to say, hey, I want to I want to be part of the legislature? Yeah, well, it, it it really didn't go that way. You know, I was uh, on faculty um, at the University of New Mexico in the Department of Surgery. And uh, my my research interest had always been medical ethics. And so as I got into medical ethics, it, it kind of naturally brought me into public policy and kind of what what we consider to be ethical or unethical uh, in healthcare. And I found myself doing a little bit of lobbying up in Santa Fe. And before you knew it, uh, I was running for office. So that's that's kind of the short part of it. Never, never thought. I would end up uh, going into politics, especially with busy surgical practice. But here I am. Yeah, goodness, I mean, I'm just wondering how you make it new. I live next to a guy. His name was Steve Comadina. I don't know if you know Steve, but he was. Oh, he, I know Steve very he, well. He, yeah, he used to be my next door neighbor, and so, um, <laughs> you know, I, I know he's he was on the state medical board, and then he was a state senator for a while, and, and you know, yeah. doing some of the stuff, and so. Um, let me ask you, you know, I guess uh, just some of the policy issues that you're concerned around. Obviously, you know, I, you, you obviously appear to have an interest in nutrition, which as, as a physician, you know, I'm not practicing anymore, but I'm, I'm basically doing basically lifestyle type stuff. And we have a company that gets people off medications and treats root cause and all this stuff. And it's, it's, it's really rewarding, quite honestly. But what, um, what try to things are you trying to, what, where are the problems you, did you see with, with, with our nutrition system and as it's, as it's applied to schools and other federal and state entities and how can we change that? Yeah. Well, uh, well, I can, I can give you a list of a lot of problems, of course, but I think the overlying theme is that the individual is disenfranchised in regards to their health. They're disenfranchised from an education standpoint. They're disenfranchised because we have gotten in the way of the doctor-patient relationship. Um, not just doctors and patients, but any kind of healthcare providers and the patient. We've gotten in the way of that relationship. And then we've allowed kind of the larger corporations to to kind of you know move in and kind of, and kind of run the show. Um, and so I, I think you know for for me it, it it all starts with empowering the individual. How do we help an individual person who is concerned about their health? If they have a health problem, how do we help them navigate this very large kind of corporate and impersonal system? And how do we how do we give them the reins? Um, o over their health. And, and obviously, there's a lot of policy solutions to that. And, and you know, you brought up schools. That's just one example. You have little kids that they, they just show up to school and they're, they're going to, what are they going to do? They're going to consume what, what, what's in that school, right? Um, unless they have a parent that's, you know, hey, this is the only thing you can eat sort of thing. But, but by and large, a lot of the kids are, are, once again, it's that word disenfranchised and helping people uh, navigate the, those issues. Why, I'm just wondering, is there not a bipartisan sort of appetite to 
fix this sort of stuff or is it, is it just become hyper-partisan and, you know, whatever you like, they, they oppose just on principle or is there some level of like, Hey guys, we don't want a bunch of sick kids or, or sick patients. Yeah, no, I, I think there is an element of bipartisanship. You know, I've, I've had a lot of, I've seen a lot of interest across the aisle and kind of some of the ideas that I, I, I throw out there, for example, um, you know, I think we've lost control over, over our food supply. And, and people are just, you know, you go to the grocery store and once again, just like the kids in the school, you're going to eat kind of what's there in general, unless you're very, very intentional and kind of swimming upstream. And uh, so I've thrown out ideas such as how do we reduce the distance between the, you know, the consumer and, and wherever the, the food products come from. Uh, that's just one example of, of, I think, some bipartisanship that I've, that I've seen. What are your thoughts on, you know, like you said, the food supply and I like, every, I don't know, in this community, there's a lot of, we got a lot of meat eaters here where people eat a bunch of meat and, and it, it actually, it's been helping people, believe it or not. It's actually, we get people off medications, rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis patients, they eat a bunch of yeah. meat and cut out some other stuff and, and their, their, their stuff goes away. And so we see a push nationally, you know, particularly in the, in the, in under the sort of the, the umbrella of, of, you know, saving the planet from climate change, we're going to. You know, other countries certainly we're seeing that they're cutting back on their agriculture. They're decimating some of the some of the animal agriculture. Now, New Mexico, I, I didn't realize this, but it's quite a big dairy state. I mean, it's one of the biggest dairy states in the in the country. And I mean, so you got a lot of cattle. Obviously, you know, anybody that's driven through New Mexico, there's a lot of open land there. There's not much going on. And I saw you had a comment about some of the feral cows being being shot for reasons I'm not exactly sure why. But what are your thoughts on? Uh, how we should, what do you think the, the, the plan is for our food supply? Is it going to be further consolidation where a handful of companies own everything and, and we put all these independent producers out or, or are there protections from that? Well, um, yeah, you, you raised a lot, a lot of good points. Um, so I, I do see partisanship in, in this issue. There's, there's kind of what I find to be an irrational prejudice against agriculture um, against especially cattle. And, and yeah, that really came to a head recently with uh, the United States uh, Forest Service. They came in and literally shot and killed feral cows that were in uh, a you know, wilderness area in southwest New Mexico. And, uh, you know, you, you just wonder if, if this kind of craze against, uh, against cows uh, didn't exist. You, you just kind of wonder if, if that would have happened. And of course, we were seeing similar things in Europe and Ireland, kind of anti-dairy movement, anti-farming and ranching movements. Um, and so, yeah, so we, we're, we're seeing some problems there. And I, I do see a problem and it's going to be directly related to our food supply. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, well, I'm, well, for one, I'm surprised there's, there's even feral cows anymore. I'm just, you know, I guess maybe there's enough remote land in New Mexico where, where that could exist. Maybe they escaped from Mexico and ran across the board like every, you know, everybody else does perhaps. Um, but, you know, I'm just, I, I guess I'm surprised. Well, what, what, what was the reason for shooting where they were, they were in trample land. And then, you know, there's people talking about, we're going to end animal agriculture and then we're going to rewild everything. Well, then you've got the same thing, you know, wild animals running all over the place, uncontained and uncontrolled. And so if the reason is these cattle were trampling something or something, what are you going to do when we, we re rewild everything? Shoot all the the elk and the antelope as well. Yeah, and, and exactly. And, and you go back to what naturally occurs just in in nature. You know, do do you just suddenly have? Uh, and I I'm not exactly sure how many they shot. I, I know there was at least 150 that they were looking at. So I, I I'm not sure. I could be stand corrected on the number, but let's just say 100. Okay. You have a hundred cows that just suddenly die suddenly and, and they're sitting around to rot. I mean, you, you almost wonder what is that going to do to that, that ecosystem there? And, and I, I don't have the answers, but it, it's just a very, very unnatural thing uh, to do. And, and it was, a, it was a controversial, I think a controversial issue, but I, I've seen that in the context, you know, it's, it's the context that bothers me, the context of um, a lot of our other dairy farms uh, being attacked with very, very strict regulations. I have a good friend who's an alfalfa farmer. The dairy that he supplies uh, is shut down last year. And he had to totally shift his you know, way of life, his, 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 his means of providing for his family. And, uh, and you just see this over and over and over again. And it's, it, it, it's just, just a concern.
Well, I mean, there's a point where, you know, you got to realize that these people are feeding us, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty important, uh, important job that they have. And, and I think we underappreciate them. Let me ask, because you talked about disenfranchisement of the, of the doctor patient relationship and you have this interposition of these, you know, big and, and it's many, many small hospitals are being bought up by these giant healthcare systems. You know, uh, we're seeing more and more of this, this corporate blanket blanket policy and there's very little nuance and and you know and and I know you've been talking about uh, the pandemic that we went through and there was there were some definite issues with that with regard to and I, I felt informed consent was perhaps not being done appropriately in many cases um what I mean and this is just one example and we can see where the 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 more that we have this just sort of big corporations that own everything you know, starting to, to do stuff like it. What are, what are the concerns you have around like the future of healthcare? Yeah. So what we've seen in New Mexico, and I, I want everyone to kind of understand how these things happen. And I, I tell people this all the time, regulation is a commodity for the big and powerful. So the, the, the bigger and powerful corporations, they, they have the resources to, you know, to process all the audits and all the regulations, right? And, and the little person, the little independent pharmacy or, or independent family practice doctor doesn't have that, that ability. And so what we've done in New Mexico is we've created an environment where it's almost impossible even to get malpractice insurance if you're just, if you're the little guy. And so that has really, really weeded out a lot of the smaller practices. And what's important to understand about that is, you know, my philosophy of healthcare. People ask me, well, what do you what do you specialize in? What do you do? And I say, well, I have my areas, but at the end of the day, I'm most interested at serving the needs of my community. So if I were to tomorrow, if I were to move to Missouri or Alaska or California or wherever, that's what I would be most interested in doing is assessing what are the needs of the community. But a, a, a corporate conglomerate, I'm not going to name any names. We're not we're not going to we're not here to you know trash any particular company, but uh, what, what we've seen them doing is they came in and, and actually one of the groups here in New Mexico just fired the rest of their surgeons um, because once again, our, our malpractice problem in New Mexico has, has really hit ahead and become a, a true crisis, creating an exodus. Position. And so who has the highest malpractice insurance premiums? Well, it's certainly right. So these large corporations, they're not based in our community, right? They're based somewhere else out of state, somewhere far, far away. And, and all these decisions are, are purely financial. We obviously have to make financial decisions. We have to be reasonable. But at the end of the day, those smaller practices, they're going to be making financial decisions too, but they have much more of a, of a leeway to make decisions to tailor their practices to meet the needs of their communities, unlike a big corporate conglomeration or hospital chain could do. Yeah, we've seen over the last, you know, 30, 40 years, a, a tremendous growth in the number of administrators in, in and around healthcare, whereas the physician numbers are pretty flat. I mean, they haven't really grown that much. So we have, we have, we've so corporatized it, made it so much of a business slash bureaucracy that it is, uh, you know, it's, I don't know how much of that's just wasted money at the end of the day, because, you know, you're paying all these administrative salaries and, you know, we, you know, in, in the United States, we're spending what, $4 trillion a year, probably even more now on healthcare and, and we don't have a very healthy population for it. And so if you were the, I don't know, Surgeon General of the US or something, or had significant impact on the healthcare system, how would you go about maybe adjusting that so we could maybe better have healthier people? Yeah, well, let me tell you, that, that'd be a neat job, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, well, you know, it, it would be to, to shift the focus to root, root causes. Mm -hmm root causes. Our healthcare system has been set up to just, you know, identify your sickness. And I actually just saw this in our state budget. Our state budget that we just passed in New Mexico has performance parameters for government departments. And so they'll say, okay, you get a little extra funding if you meet this and this and this. And a lot of these in the Department of Health were actually just compliance with your prescription medication. Mm. It had nothing to do with curing your illness. It had nothing with nothing to do with wellness well-being or anything like that, we, it, it seems that the, the actual ends or, or the goals of healthcare are, are to just keep people compliant with their, their pharmaceuticals. Um, now, you know, obviously nothing wrong with taking a prescription drug if you need to, but, but we should not at all be, be saying that is the actual end goal is just, are you, are, you being, are you being a good patient and just taking your medicine? No, we want to, as a physician, I want to cure people's illnesses. It's not always possible. 
obviously, but I want that. I want to address root causes of sickness. Yeah. And so, yeah, if I was U.S. Surgeon General, I would be talking a lot about our food supply. I think that is a massive, massive issue. And, and so I, if, I, if I could boil it down to two things, I'd say our food supply, as long as, you know, exercise too and that sort of thing, healthy lifestyle. And then number two would be restoring the doctor-patient relationship. Yeah, the the quote the conspiracy theorist in me sort of believes that pharmaceutical companies want to keep people on drugs, and that the the food manufacturers just want to have people eat junky, unhealthy food and, and make money on that. Is that does that make me should I put on a tinfoil hat for that, or do you see that? I mean, what what's the you know if we look behind the scenes at the at the sausage making of politics, you mentioned Coca Cola flies their executives in and squashes their bill. How much of that happens, and why does that happen? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, you have to look, go back to the individual, individual that has a job that is getting a, a paycheck, may or may not be a month to month person, and, and they have a job to do, right? And so is it a conspiracy where someone is malignant or, or, or very, you know, uh, prejudicial or, or, or downright mean or angry? No, I, I don't think there's a ton of that. I'm sure there, there might be a little bit of that going on. But that's not a conspiracy theory. It's just, you know, thousands of people doing the, their jobs and, and trying to do the, what the best they can to, to get a paycheck and provide for themselves and, and their families. And, and a lot of that adds up to, uh, in my opinion, kind of predatory practices that, that obviously, you know, keep those paychecks coming. So it's really the, I think the financial channels, the incentives and the financial incentives that, that we've set up, it's not really the, the evil person in an ivory tower per se, conspiracy theory. It's just the fact that, hey, we have, uh, you know, for example, you know, over 40% of Coca-Cola's revenue comes from from food stamps, you know? So it's kind of like if, if you set up that system, well, you're, you're just going to, you know, if you subsidize it, you're going to get more of it, right? So if we're going to subsidize terrible diets and terrible foods, we're going to get more of those and we're going to get people eating them. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's just following where the money goes. I think this year, California passed a bill basically threatening physicians with licenses if they didn't sort of toe the line on certain issues. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Is that, is that likely yes. to spread? And is it, I mean, I, I know it's going to be cha- challenging the courts, but I mean, do you, do you see, cause New Mexico is a fairly blue state. I mean, I know you're Republican in New Mexico, which is probably maybe harder. I don't know what the, what the ratio is in, in the, in the legislature, but any concerns as a physician that that could come out about and, and, you know, because I, mean, I, I can see, you know, you want to be able to have some independence to make thoughts with the patient in front of you. And instead of having some lawmaker who may have no idea about healthcare making these mandates that are coming from likely some kind of corporation, maybe a pharmaceutical company. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, um, so yeah, we've seen it in California, thankfully so far I've had a favorable uh, protection from, uh, from the courts. But um, I, I see that in New Mexico, um, and uh, it, it, it's starting over very controversial issues, of course, you know, with COVID, um, we had, I had four or five complaints come in from out of state based on my social media uh, posting. Of course, one of those was with masking. I was very adamant from the beginning that community masking does nothing for COVID spread. And here we are, you know, two or three years later now with a Cochrane review that says that. And uh, however, our own medical board uh, really was very aggressive, uh, sent me many letters, uh, said, you know, you're going to be in trouble. I had to give them all this response about, you know, and, and supposed justification for my statements, even though these people were, none of them were my patients. And so this is just a very bizarre way to be treated as a physician. And then in the, in the legislature as well. Um, um, among, once again, I, it's mainly in contentious issues where there's partisanship, COVID, um, kind of a lot of the transgender uh, medicine uh, uh, situation. We are putting into law where you, uh, very, very serious uh, First Amendment free speech obstacles that say, you know, you can't say anything that would deter somebody. You can't say, you know, I'm like, but what does deter mean? Or, or indirectly interfere with. You cannot, as a physician, you cannot indirectly interfere with such and such. Uh, so, uh, yeah, all of those are patently unconstitutional, but we're still pushing them through the legislature here. Yeah, it, it is a weird... I just look around and I see some very strange stuff and I'm, I'm just gonna, it's almost like it's, it's some sort of dream almost to see that. Yeah, I was, you know, as a surgeon as well, I wore a mask my whole career and I, same thing. I said, this is, this makes no sense for what the purposes are trying to do. I mean, it's mostly to keep crap out of your face and, you know, it's not preventing you from spreading a virus to it, to your patient. It just, but anyway, that's, that, that argument has been fought many, many times. 
you know, as far as the politics, I mean, do you have aspirations to continue with this? I mean, have you, have you tasted and say, oh my, this is awful. I want to get out. Or are you like, I want to keep making a difference and maybe, maybe I don't know what the next step would be, maybe running for a national office, you know, as a congressman or something or what, I mean, I don't know what the reality is because it depends where you live. I mean, right. If you live in a, you run as a Republican in a strictly blue state, good luck. Right. You know? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, that's a good question. Honestly, I'm, I'm undecided on that. Like I said, uh, coming into politics as a position, uh, we don't, and in, in, in our legislature, we have what's called the citizen legislature. So you, you don't really have, you know, you don't have full-time staff or a salary or anything. So it, it is a bit different here in New Mexico. Um, but I, I'd say, uh, you know, the way I got into politics was unexpected. And then I, I'd say what we're going to see, you know, what what happens in the future. You know, I spent a few years in the House, now I'm in the Senate. Didn't see that one coming either necessarily that I go from House to Senate, but it, the opportunity presented itself. And so we'll just kind of kind of see how things go. I, I, I'll tell you one thing for sure. I'm very interested in being part of the national conversation to get a grip on our, on the health of our nation, because. We are, as a, as a nation, we're very, very sick. I think we're a lot sicker than we realize we are. And we, we need to have people just speaking truth and defending evidence-based medicine, because I'm telling you right now, evidence-based medicine is dead in America right now. We need to revive it. That's great. That's a great, powerful statement. You know, I, I interviewed a guy named Gordon Guyatt, who you may not know, but he's he's at a University of McMaster's in Canada. He actually coined the term evidence-based medicine back in 1991. So I talked to him about some of the stuff around, you know, different, uh, you know, nutrition topics and stuff like that. But what is the way forward in your view as far as, you know, do we have to, because, you know, we saw some really concerning things over the last couple of years about scientific consensus being manufactured, not organically happening through robust debate, which is how we're supposed to do science. How do we, how do we fix all that stuff? And, you know, I mean, there's just a mess all across the board. I mean, social media censorship and, you know, the, the squashing of dissenting opinions. How do we, how do we restore that? You think? I, I predict that a judge is going to hand down a pretty harsh uh, ruling on that California law. And I think people are going to learn their lesson. So, you know, we'll see some favorability from the courts. And thankfully, we have a lot of free speech uh, protections in this country. But uh, where do we go from here? Well, I'll, I'll give you one. I can give you a lot of specific examples depending on how much time we have. But, but one thing is to have maturity on both sides of the aisle. OK, because both sides of the aisle can can mess this up. They can mess it up in a red state. The majority can mess it up. Uh, the majority here in a blue state where I am, they can mess it up. And and so looking at commissions and commissions and, and, and committees having a, a balanced approach, for example, let's just take the CDC, for example. We've gotten a lot of, of in my view, a lot of kind of politicized data uh, from the CDC and very low quality data and, and policy recommendations based on low quality data. And so what, what I'd rather see is, hey, you know, as a policymaker, I'm going to support commissions and boards and committees that are balanced. And if you cannot come up with an overwhelming majority, let's just say two thirds, maybe not unanimous, but if you can't come, if you can't have a two thirds decision on policy recommendations, when you're both looking at different from, from different perspectives, but you're looking at the same evidence, if you can't come up with a consensus, then don't be making a policy recommendation. Just, just you know, keep your mouth shut. But if you can come to a consensus from different perspectives, then yes, then bring that out to the to the public. So that that's one thing is that I, I think our policymakers need to, when we set up our commissions and boards and, and departments of health and things, we need to depoliticize. And that's how you can depoliticize is require big time consensus when we're coming up with policy recommendations. How does like, you know, like me as a non, you know, I'm not, I'm not in any elected office. I'm, I'm a concerned citizen, so to speak. How do we best impact, like, how do, how do we get our messages out there? What, what we have an interest in? Do we talk to the local? I mean, I, 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 writing a letter to the president is going to get me nowhere, right? I'm never going to see it. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, I guess, you know, at the localist level, is that, is that the best way to do this? Or how do we as citizens impact what we think our concerns around policy should be? Yeah, I, I think starting starting local. I tell people all the time, go just go local. You know, we we need I think to 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 keep going in this country. We need to just rely on our local control, respect state sovereignty. You know, if a blue state wants to lean a little left, well, that's what the people are voting for. Let them do that. 
if, if the people lean to the right and the reds say, well, let them do that, but don't go after them with, with a bunch of centralized mandates and, and, and be so aggressive, especially when you're not part of that community. So, so yeah, just keeping it in your community, talking to your local, you know, county commissioners and city councilors about, about these issues. And I think one of another, another good um, uh, strategy is to have, is to hold them accountable, ha have your local officials, um, even if it's someone like a state senator or U.S. congressman or somebody that's maybe a little, you know, has a lot of constituents, um, see if they'll be willing to commit and sign a pledge. You know, are you going to sign a pledge to support our our food supply and improve the food supply and, and have a have a few, you know, just develop a pledge, have, have four or five things that you're going to support and say, hey, I, I will not vote to continue to do such and such. I'm not going to continue to vote to, you know, kill cattle and, and, and destroy our, our, our local ranching and farming. I'm going to support local, you know, whatever it is, CSAs and farm to table movements and things like that. So, so those are a few ideas to throw out there. I mean, like I said, a lot of ideas, but I'll just kind of throw out a few. How do you, you know, I mean, as a Senator, I'm sure you're tasked to vote on all, a whole variety of issues and, you know, you can, put forth bills that you have an, a particular interest in, you know, as a, as a surgeon, you know, obviously healthcare is going to be in your wheelhouse, but like, you know, if it comes to like, I don't know, drilling oil or something, you know, energy stuff, how do you, how do you educate yourself and where do you, where do you get the information to help you make the decision? Is it, you know, you have a, you lean on certain experts and they, and depending on how much you trust them how, or how does that work for you? So you have to read a lot, <laughs> you know, and, and, and you do have to, in some way, be a jack of all trades. But I, I think what, first and foremost, for anyone that's going to develop public policy, you need to really know where you stand on your principles. And so I ask myself all the time, is this going to shift power or, or is this going to shift power away from the individual and consolidate power? Because that's a central theme that I see. Uh, shifting power away from small businesses, away from you as an individual uh, that wants to take care of your health. So that's probably number one in my book. You know, does this centralized power, uh, does it hold people uh, accountable? So I, I think at the end of the day, you have to have relationships. You know, I, I have, yeah, some other folks that come from, um, my district is a very kind of outdoorsy district. Uh, we're just outside of Albuquerque. We live in the mountains, we have beautiful forest and, and a, lot of, a lot of hikers, et cetera. And, and so, you know, I have my constituents that are like that. And then I have, folks that are down in oil and gas country. And so I'll go ask, uh, you know, trusted friends, Hey, what do you, what do you think about this? Uh, I've read a lot of books, read a lot of books on all sorts of issues uh, that I normally wouldn't. It's kind of my chance to take my, my surgeon's cap off and, and learn about a lot of things, taxation roads. Yeah. Oil and gas and, and all those sorts of things. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a fascinating process, but yeah, you just have to, you have to be a lifelong learner really, if you want to be a good politician, I think. Yeah, when I started advocating for more meat in the diet, I had to learn a lot about cattle production and the environment. I, you know, it's all this stuff I had no, no real interest in prior to. But then it was like you, you have to, you have to learn about this stuff. And so it's kind of interesting how, how interesting it, it can be. You know, obviously you're you're focused on on some of the health stuff. What other policy issues are you do you have interest in, or, or are you looking to to impact in the in the coming? I don't know how long your tenure is as a senator in New Mexico. Is it is it a four year deal, or what is uh what is the deal on that anyway? Yeah, yeah, I'm serving a four year term. Well, really, you know, um, my yeah, at the end of the day, if you're going to be a good politician, you have to represent your constituents, and so my, yeah, my constituents are they 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 want to be uh, in general, they kind of want to be left alone you know, by, by the governments, I, I support anything that's going to empower local governments over, over centralizing, you know, state control. People are very involved in, in with that. Um, the crime situation in Albuquerque, you know, we're, we're number one per capita in property crime. Um, our violent crime continues to rise and rise and rise. And so uh, that's been a huge problem. Um, and and I'm, I'm actually become, a, you know, fairly interested in, in the energy issue. You know, climate change seems to uh, steer so much policy. I mean, even from trucking regulations, obviously uh, food supply, meat food supply, you know, it's like you, you wouldn't, you know, you got to kind of connect the dots. And so I, I think I naturally find anything that I can bring a scientific um, uh, flavor to, I, I naturally am drawn to that. So I think the, the energy issue has, has been something like that. So my my uh, or to, to to conclude, I'd say my my two committees that I'm on, I'm on I'm on the health committee, but I'm also on the conservation committee because I'm very very interested in in conservation. Yeah, and I'm just wondering, you know, because the energy thing, and you know, I 
I, I read on both sides of the because I'm not an expert. I'm, I have no idea. I can't go outside and say, oh, it looks like the climate changing. I've got no way to assess it. I can, I'm a little bit better about assessing my own health. I can kind of think I can objectively do that pretty well. But how, you know, what, where do you see, um, I mean, I know there's some people who say we should be putting up nuclear power plants. They're generally pretty safe and they put out a lot of cheap energy. Uh, is there any any appetite for something like that in New Mexico or is that, or are we more like we're going to put windmills up and solar panels everywhere? What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really heavy into wind and solar. And, and let me just go back to, to the beef example. You know, you have a, a cow and, and what is, what does that cow do? Well, it, it goes around and it, it grazes, right? Or at least that's what it should be doing. And so it's taking all that low density energy from the sun that grew the grass. And then it takes in that grass and it consolidates the energy source into a more energy dense substance, right? So we can go and eat a cow and we have a fairly energy dense, nutritious food source versus grass. Number one, we can't digest grass, but even if we could, we'd have to eat you know, tons of it. That's one example of what a cow does naturally that consolidates energy. What we're trying to do with the energy sector is we're trying to harness so, you know, very energy sparse sources like wind and solar. Wind and solar should be used where the energy does not need to be stored. You know, look at the old school cowboy windmill, right? Beautiful example of harnessing the wind energy, but you can't store wind energy. It just pumps the well right when the wind is blowing. What a wonderful and innovative thing that's been around for, <laughs> for a long time. And, and But with what do plants do that solar panels will never do? Plants, they can store the energy. They store it in, in sugar. And we're trying to bypass a natural mechanism. Um, so my, my general mantra with this is we need to be relying on very energy dense sources. Um, right now we have oil and gas you know, available, which are more energy dense. They have their own problems. And I, I'm a proponent of, of, of nuclear energy because that's the most energy dense uh, source that we have. And, and if you go back to the cow example, you just think about what is what is natural? What, what do we find you know, in nature? And are we trying to, to go? Are we trying to just swim upstream and, and create something that was never, ever meant to be? I, I don't believe solar energy was, was meant to be consolidated and used for, a, you know, for you know, a jet flying 500 miles an hour. I mean, I think that's 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 ridiculous. We need to allow those the natural mechanisms that consolidate the sun's energy and and use those once again. Cattle's a perfect example, um, but putting it into a giant giant lithium battery that's taking up tons of water, tons of spots and spots of land. I think it'd be very disruptive to the environment. We think we need to harness our more innovative energy solutions. Uh, such as such as nuclear, and so that's the general kind of snapshot. Of work. Yeah, one of the criticisms I've heard about you know uh, you know the the renewable or the wind wind solar is that um, you know it's, it's been around for you know a long time, fifty years or something like that, and it still only represents something like three percent of the world's power. And so you you know we we we've got a lot to to make up for if we're going to continue to. Uh, you know, live in the, live in air conditioned homes and, and things like that, which I think generally improves most people's quality of life. And so uh, that's an interesting uh, concept. How how long does it take to to get something changed in policy? I mean, is this a, is this a multi year process, or can you can you do, you know? I guess it depends on the, the 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 urgency, I suppose. But like like if you wanted to change the f school food policy, how much how much effort and work does that take? Yeah, I, I think in general, uh, you're looking at a three to four year process to get anything suitable done, because no matter what state you're at, it can become more complicated. But if you have, uh, you know, you're going to have to have a governor that's supportive and, and you may just you may start this movement where the governor just flat out isn't supportive. Right. The, the biggest opponent to our uh, healthy schools initiatives was actually our largest school district, Albuquerque Public Schools. Um, they didn't want to have to deal with the extra work. They had issues with the extra expense and just all, all that stuff. And so you'll have generally with, a, with anything that's new or innovative, you're going to have to bring a lot of the parties on board. And if you have someone that's opposing your bill, like the largest school district in the state, well, you know, good luck getting your, your bill through. But um, yeah, generally, you, you have to get you have to get public support. You've got to get support of, of different organizations and lobbying groups. And then, of course, the actual lawmakers themselves. So I'm just wondering because, you know, sometimes I'll see bills that are, that are crafted that 
will never pass. I mean, this is so ridiculous. Why do, why even do that? Why do people even do that? Is this to make a statement or is it try to draw them over a little bit to the other side and they do these extreme things just to, just to get something, some compromise or why, why are those things, why waste the time on that stuff? It is. Yeah. And, and, and that's called a messaging bill. And, uh, you know, you, you sometimes do that out of, I mean, I've seen politicians do that even out of, out of sarcasm or out of response to another kind of outlandish bill, you know, <laughs> But I, I think that, yeah, messaging bills, what will happen is, you know, we just saw one actually, and I actually called it out before the vote. I said, eh, I don't think this is going to pass and it's certainly not going to reach the governor's desk because it's just unconstitutional. I said, this is a messaging bill for the, the lobby behind this. Um, it, it was it was a bit, you know, I started, you know, I, I'm bringing up you know, a lot of fairly contentious issues, but it was uh, it, it was an immigration bill that was seeking to, you know, basically subvert the, what the federal government's role is. And I said, look, I, I know the state might want to get involved in this, but legally we just can't. And this is the federal, you know, the federal government takes care of, of customs and immigration issues. And, and if you disagree with the federal government, that's fine, but we're a state in the union and you can't just file a bill that just says, well, we want to pretend like we're not part of the union right now. We're going to do our own thing. No, you, you can't do that. There's a supremacy clause in the United States Constitution that you can't get around. So, uh, so yeah, we, we see the messaging bills that are kind of outlandish. Um, both parties, once again, they have kind of their people that are a little out there and maybe they just want to file a bill just because they just because they can. Right. It's free country. But um, at, the, at the end of the day, I mean, I don't have a major problem with some of these messaging bills as long as they're not too you know, taking up too much time, but we do see them in New Mexico. You mentioned that the Albuquerque public school system was was opposed to the the healthy food, whatever whatever you called it. What was in the bill? I mean, as far as I mean, what, what, what were the? How did you determine what was healthy food? Because sometimes some of the things I see is like you know, like like if you go to New York State, they're like we're going to have a vegan Friday and a meatless Monday, and I'm like that's not good. You know, we've got. <laughs> pretty good data that, you know, that cognitively kids do better when they have high quality animal protein in the diet or, or fats in the diet. Mm -hmm. What, what, what was the content of that bill that they opposed? Was it just the administrative paperwork? The, the food had to cost more and what was it? What were you looking at trying to get done? Or, or Yeah. I don't know all the technical issues. I just know it was going to create more, more work for them at the end of the day. I don't know specifically why, but here, here was the crux of the bill. The bill said that the food has to closely resemble its original state at least seven i think 75 percent of the core content must resemble its original state so for example like you know like a donut you know that does not reveal it's you know that has nothing to do with the original state right so that's out um you know something like you know cook cook carrots or broccoli or something that that closely resembles the original state that would that would count right but the, my, my so I don't have a problem with that moving toward that if that's not in existence. But we have a couple of, of, of issues. Number one is the added sugar. Uh, the bill did nothing about added sugar. You know, the USDA kind of has this loose rule recommendation. Well, it's got to be less than 10 percent added sugar, which I think we need to be, I mean, less than 5 percent. But um, so the bill did nothing to address the added sugar issue. And then in reality, this is the last thing I'll say with this is. When you walk into a public school, at least in our state, it's not just what the cafeteria is serving. You, you go around, there's there's club, you know, the, the chess club and the sports clubs and all this. Sort of, I mean, they're selling, you walk right in, they're selling donuts and pizza, Cokes and Dr. Peppers and all that sort of stuff. So we should not be pretending that our kids are just going to walk in and just eat whatever the cafeteria serves them. In reality, you know, this bill, I think, gives us a, sort of a good feel good win and a headline. It's not bad. But it, it really, I think, is not going to bring transformative change to nutrition in our public schools. Let me ask you to put your, your doctor back, hat back on for a moment here and talk about as an ENT surgeon, because as an orthopedic surgeon, you know, I went into that because I was like, I don't want to deal with all this chronic disease. Just give me a broken bone and I'll stick a rod down it, right? So, <laughs> but what I came to realize is most of what I was seeing was this chronic disease. It was, you know, all this arthritis and tendinopathy and peripheral neuropathy and all that stuff was or per correct compression neuropathy was a manifestation of poor metabolic health. Do you see similar things in your line of specialty with ENT? I mean, is there anything that you think nutrition impacts, you know, like sinusitis in the ear and, and you know, the ear, nose and throat stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and there's a lot of uh, debate out there because as, as you know, um, we have, um, it, it's hard to do dietary studies, right? It's hard to get good, high quality evidence um, with, with with some of some of these things. So 
but I, I do. I see a lot of chronic sinusitis. I see a lot of people that just say they just don't feel well, right? And chronic sinusitis um, has uh, very, you know, it affects quality of life significantly for people. They have what's called kind of brain fog or lack of ability to, to be attentive. Uh, they miss tons and tons of work because they're chronic sinus, sinusitis. And so that, you know, that's just one example of any, any sort of, and we see autoimmune diseases that affect the middle ear as well as sinus cavities, people's ability to breathe and smell, that sort of thing. So it does come into play. I do talk to people about, about their diets um, and, and trying to keep kind of food diaries. Um, even the, scent, the, the balance system, the vestibular system um, has certain dietary or, or certain dietary restrictions or, or, or differences can really, really help. Uh, patients. And I've even had patients come back. They, I've made a dietary recommendation and, and, and they came back and they said, you know what, doc, I, I actually didn't believe you when you told me, but you know, my wife made me do it. And then I felt so much better. So thanks. <laughs> you know? Well, good for you to even mention it. Cause most, you know, I, I even get gastroenterologists and I, I see people with, with Crohn's disease and they come off the biologic and they become asymptomatic and their colonoscopy shows an absence of disease just by making dietary change. And yet they're gastroenterologists say the diet has nothing to do with that disease. I'm like, that's completely crazy for me, but there's some, yeah. that, some that out there that, that don't, don't get it at all. And, and thank you for at least in, you know, uh, realizing that's the case. And I know as a surgeon, it's tough because, you know, you got, you know, you're, you're seeing so many patients so quickly and it's just tough to have that 30 minute conversation around lifestyle and diet. And we don't, we're, we're just not, that's the other thing about the healthcare system. It's, it's just, it's designed for throughput these days. It's like, how many patients can you see in a day? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, just the other day I, I saw—I can't remember the company—they made a four hundred million dollar payment uh, to the, you know, National Institute of, of Allergy and Infectious Disease. I mean, I, I, it was some—I don't know if it was Merck or GlaxoSmithKline, somebody, that, or no, it was Moderna, I think. You know, so you have you have these pharmaceutical companies that that are are investing heavily, heavily, heavily in not only nutrition research but but drug research, and and the the nutrition research is is. I think when it's funded by, you know, Coca-Cola or someone else, well, guess what we're going to get? We're going to get these ridiculous studies that I'm sure you saw an NIH, uh, NIH funded study out of Tufts that was like, <laughs> where was beef? Beef was at the right, very right. bottom. Behind you know, whatever charms, you do, yeah. don't eat beef. You better eat your, your Lucky Charms and your, your frosted mini wheats and stuff like that. I mean, that's why we get ridiculous studies. It, it's once again, not, not a conspiracy theory. It's just where the, where the money comes from. You, you get what you pay for. And, you know, back to your Surgeon General question, well, I, heck, I, I, would, I would be saying, hey, we need grassroots level dietary studies. If, if we want to empower physicians, you know, like the, the GI doctor, you said, well, the GI doctor, well, it, it's the way they were trained, right? It's the way they were trained because the availability of data is not there. And if we could get into the medical schools, get into the nutrition studies and actually fund things that, hey, they're not going to make some corporations a lot of money. Who are they going to empower? They're going to empower the individual, right? <laughs> and who wants to do that nowadays? Well, I do. But I, I think that's what we need to do is we need to shift our funding structures to research that's going to help the, the doctor and the patient make good decisions and address those grassroots level root cause problems of disease. And illness. What do we do about regulatory capture? Like things like at the FDA, where 65% of their, their drug approvals are funded by the pharmaceutical companies themselves, and they, they swap board members back and forth. And how do we, yeah. can, can we extricate, extricate ourselves from that relationship and just rebuild the whole thing? Is that what's going to take? Or, and I don't know at the state level, if you have any impact on that, but <clears throat> as a physician, we'll I have to be aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have, you know, we actually have some pretty good transparency laws in New Mexico, uh, sunshine laws, open meetings acts and things like that. And that's what Congress needs to do. I mean, I, I can't do that from where I'm at. I can't make, you know, the CDC and the NIH change how they do things. But, but you have to be, you have to pass very good transparency uh, bills, you know, require people to uh, disclose, you know, their, their financial contributions and things like that. And then you have to uh, require transparency. Um, and I think that's, that's some of the biggest things that could be done. I forgot the first part of your question. I'm sorry, Dr. Baker, but, um, but, but Congress, Congress can do it. Yeah. I'm just, how much, you know, as a, as a member of the state legislature in the Senate, how much um, impact do you have on the, our, our national representatives from New Mexico, the two senators from New Mexico or some of the congressmen that are there? Do you, do you interact with those folks any, any, any at all? 
Yeah, I, I do. And, and it helps, you know, yeah, when you're, yeah, you know, when you're in the state senate or, or you're a secretary of state or a governor or something, obviously you're going to have, you know, relationships with some of these folks. You know, I'm, I'm in the minority in my state. And so we have, you know, we have three uh, Democrat Congress people. We used to have, it used to be two to one, but they, they gerrymandered one of our, our districts to cr- what's called cracking. So they cracked uh, the oil and gas country right in half. And once again, something that both parties do. Um, but they they cracked them in half, so they couldn't speak as one voice. So now we lost we lost the, the Republican from down south. Um, but but yeah, we do. I I, I saw our U.S. Congresswoman uh, introduce my daughters to her when we were up at the state capitol. Um, so so some of those relationships there. And uh, yeah, it, it take, it's a it's a it's a group effort. It, this is going to be a team effort if we're going to get our country's nutrition back. It's going to require everybody at the table. Yeah, that, yeah, for sure. That that that's that's true. And and how much of a priority is that among all the things you know we're fighting wars and we're d- dictating energy policy and freedom of speech and all this stuff? I mean, is that a, is that a pretty high priority or is it kind of just like we just kick it down the road? No, I I, I get. Uh, I think it falls on deaf ears. I on the Senate floor even. I was just talking about this. I was talking about how our health system is so geared to just. Mm-hmm. You know, taking drugs, uh, no root cause stuff. I mean, I, I say it over and over again. Um, all the, the bills we pass, or we've passed six or seven bills here this session that just empower insurance companies that, that drive premiums up. And, and who wants that, right? And I say, well, we're just we're just doing it over and over again. So to be honest with you, I'll give you an honest answer, not a, not a you know, butterflies and lollipops answer. But um, it, there's not much interest uh, that I've seen. Uh, to really take back our, our health, unfortunately, at least where I'm at. Yeah, that, 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 that is, a, that is a concern. So I, you know, I almost see that if you're going to wait on the government to change that, I'm not, I'm, I'm not waiting for the president to tell me what to eat a healthy diet. And that, that's something that really truly frustrated me during this pandemic is the fact that we spent, you know, a trillion dollars on a response and we had all kinds of media. I mean, you couldn't turn around and not see a sign that said, put a mask on or stand six feet away. And yet with all that, they could have said, hey, this would be a good time to drop 10 pounds, maybe stop eating all the pro- ultra processed garbage. That message could have easily, and, and it would have helped and because we know unequivocally that obesity, diabetes, all these, you know, these metabolic diseases, which are very easily, uh, you know, at least impacted by these simple measures, was not even discussed. Why, why do you think that was? Why do you think no one had the appetite to even mention that on a national or even on a state policy scale? You know, I think there's a very deep, uh, very profound uh, answer that I probably don't have a full grasp on, but, you know, history repeats itself. That's all I can say. You look back at the Spanish flu. I don't think a lot of people know about this, but you look back at the Spanish flu, you say, well, why was it so deadly? Was it, was it really that the virus was so bad? Well, I think the virus was bad. But if you look at firsthand accounts and you actually do a lot of research on this, this is even disturbing to talk about. But the mantra of the day was, once again, we go back to pharmaceutical company. Bayer had just come up with, with aspirin. Um, and, and the Spanish flu was commonly treated with massive doses of aspirin. Uh, we're talking like, I don't know, 10, 12 grams a day. For some reason, that was the you know it was this anti-inflammatory drug, and I don't think they understood that it was causing hemorrhagic yeah. pneumonitis and things like that. So th- that's that's you know it is how much of this was actually iatrogenic? How how much of it did we make worse? And so we see an example. This is what happened about a hundred years ago with the Spanish flu. I think a lot of the response we we as people made worse. And I think you're, you're spot on, Dr. Baker. And, and yeah, it, it's let's not talk about, I mean, the, one of the biggest risk factors that we don't want to talk about because it's po- not politically correct is, is obesity. And, and there, there's no, you know, absolutely, it's, it's wrong to, you know, give a person a hard time or, or be, you know, prejudiced against someone who, who's overweight and just make fun of them. I mean, that's a terrible way to treat someone. But, but what's also terrible is to ignore the, the negative health benefits and act like, act like everything's fine and not give your patient the truth. If, if our responsibility is to help people take control of their health, well, we have to talk to them honestly about the health effects of, of obesity. And in this case, yeah, COVID, I mean, what killed people in COVID? Massive inflammation. And what are our diets doing? <laughs> They're causing massive inflammation. And so I, I think it was malpractice from the, the, the part of our public health officials to, to leave that out. And I, I think we, we honestly led to the unnecessary deaths of just countless people. It is so sad to talk about. Yeah. I mean, inevitably there'll be some other 
epidemic pandemic that'll come in, you know, maybe five years now, maybe 15 years from now. Do you think we've learned a lesson and we'll, 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 we'll change on how we respond to that? Or do you think we'll see more of the same? I guess maybe it's depend who's in charge of the policy, I guess, at the time. Yeah. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't think we've learned our lesson. Um, you know, you see a Cochrane review that comes out about masks and people just still won't let go about it, of it. The American Academy of Pediatricians, this is days after the, the, uh, you know, the Cochrane study came out, they were, they were hailing a study on, on the amount of, of COVID, uh, uh, you know, genetic sequences in uh, wastewater and saying that masks somehow had some, you know, it was the most ridiculous outlandish uh, study that, that had, you know, that I've even seen. And you have the American Academy of Pediatricians coming out and, and right after Cochrane came out and they said, Oh, look, masks work because this, we're seeing COVID in wastewater and here you have a Cochrane review. So I, I think it's the, the problem though, is, is it's not, it's not as much about learning our lesson as it is about the fact that we have two political parties that are completely at odds against each other. You know, politics is a, it's a blood sport in America and we can't get over it. And if you're, if the evidence, the reality harms your political narrative, it's not allowed to be discussed on either side of the aisle. So, you know, we're seeing that from the left right now because they're the ones that have been in charge of the public health policy and they have the executive. We can certainly see this from the right as well um, if, if they're given a chance. And I think just this, this, the partisanship that is, is absolutely just killing us right now. And, I, I, and, and so we can't learn from it because that's not going to change anytime soon. I don't think. Yeah, and I, I can tell you, as, as, a, as, as, as frustrating as an American, uh, you know, and I was, I was a veteran and, you know, done all this stuff, you know, that um, when you see this, this continued fighting and it, it, you know, it's almost like the intentional division of, of the country into two factions. And it doesn't yeah. matter what the issue of, if these guys say is good, it doesn't, it's like you just put on your team jersey and, and just go. And that, yeah. that I don't know if, how, how we get past that. I mean, I'm just wondering if there's ever if there's an appetite. I mean, you got to be looking across somebody from the aisle and say, "Hey, you're a normal dude just like me," or you know, you got the same basic wants and desires. Why can't we just you know figure this stuff out? You know, it's just kind of frustrating to see it. Yeah, and I think the the solution once again is just to go local. Is to respect. We have to have a mutual respect for state sovereignty, and we we don't have that right now in New Mexico. You know, we we yeah. talk about, and I say I say we. I'm talking about as a Senate. You know, we talk about Texas and we say, well, they're oppressing their people because of this and that and that. Well, um, you know, I say, well, you know what, if you want to change their policy, why don't you move there and be part of their community? But don't actively pass laws that are designed to undermine the sovereignty of that state. I mean, you, you say you believe in democracy. No, I, if you're actively supporting bills to, to, to subvert the sovereignty of your neighboring state, you don't believe in democracy. So um, I think we have to have that mutual respect to each other. Once again, allow local school districts to make their own decisions about curricula, allow county commissions to, if they want to be more of a, a pro-business county, let them do that. Uh, if they want to be a, a higher regulatory county, let them do that. Uh, but let's, let's, you know, once again, let's stop centralizing control. I think that's the only way to get over our partisanship is just to, to allow decisions to be made locally. And because I think it's, that's widely supported by the public. Yeah. What is your, I mean, are you optimistic? I mean, as someone who's, you know, seeing this stuff play out in real time and have insight into things that most of us don't, I mean, do you have some level of optimism that, that you can make a difference and we can, you know, I mean, obviously we're going to change all there's change is going to be constant. Everything's changing at some point, but you see it going in a direction you think would be, uh, you know, favorable to the, for the most amount of people. I, I, I do. I do. Um, I, I see our checks and balances working, you know, um, and and I, I, I like that, you know, when you get a whatever, you get a, a legislative check on an executive or you get a judiciary check on on something on, on a legislative branch, you know, like we did in, in California when they were trying to censor doctors. So, you know, it's nice to see that. It's nice to see the, the genius of American government. Um, at, at play, even even when we're so divided. Um, so I, I like that. I think it's evidence that we have a wonderful system of government. Um, the, the key is to hold that up. And so things that frighten me, that make me, I, to, to answer your question, I am optimistic because I believe in the, 
vitality of the American people. I think we have a wonderful country. Um, but what does frighten me is things like this. When, we, when, when the U.S. Senate takes away the filibuster or when people start talking about, you know, packing the Supreme Court, when we start advocating for th- or, or taking away the Electoral College, when we and, and wherever you are on those on those issues, fine. But when when we start to want to unravel the the very DNA of how government is done, th- these foundational things like once again electoral college, Supreme Court set up all that stuff. When we start to talk about that, then you start to get me a little worried. Yeah. So if we can stay away from those things, I'm very optimistic. Fair enough. Well, uh, Senator Smith, thank you so much. I, I don't want to take too much of your time. I'm, I'm sure you got plenty of stuff to do today, and I've got a meeting as well in a few minutes. So is there any, anything, la- last minute thing you want to share before you go? Yeah, just thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I, I'm going to continue to advocate for policies, once again, that, that's going to get our food sources closer to us for local control. I mean, that's the way to go in this country. And so, uh, thank you so much for, for having me. I, I, I appreciate what you do with looking at, at our, our food supply and nutrition. And, and certainly I, I look forward to, to kind of, uh, you know, working with you in the future, looking at our, our healthy diet and, and the health of America. Well, I'll tell you, you know, if, if, you know, like you said, you mentioned the regulation is a way to squash competitors, the smaller competitors, you know, we, when, when we get to a point where we're large enough to where we start impacting the bottom line of some of these big healthcare organizations or, or drug companies, you know, maybe we need some regulatory protection. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, thanks. So then much. you'll see some studies about yeah. what, what you stand for and how terrible it is. Exactly. Exactly. Anyway, thanks so much. All right, guys, we'll see everybody else tomorrow. Thanks. Right, thanks. thanks, 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 thanks. Have a great day. Bye-bye now.